Hello and welcome to Switzer Investing. I'm Peter Switzer. Thanks for joining us. On tonight's program, I've asked Marcel von Pfeiffer, the founder of Arminius Capital, to give us five stocks from his Australian fund. And one of them actually has upside of 28% plus. And then venture capitalist Mark Carnegie looks at the big issue of whether we can ignore cryptocurrencies going forward. He says, you ignore this, at your peril. I interviewed him for my podcast and I've taken an excerpt out of the podcast to give you an idea of the big issues that he thinks all investors should be thinking about because he thinks cryptocurrencies are coming down the pike and we won't be able to ignore it. And then Charles Tarby, the founder of Century 21, looks at why house prices in 2022 will slow down. That could be important for you if you're going to be a seller or if you want to be a buyer. Waiting for 2022 might be better than buying right now. That's the show. Let's kick off with Marcel von Pfeiffer from Arminius Capital. Well, we're joined by Marcel von Pfeiffer, the founder of Arminius Capital. Marcel, thanks for joining us. A pleasure as always, Peter. How are you? Very good. Now, last time we talked, you, you said you'd share with us four or five stocks that you think locally look very attractive. Now, I presume you're saying this not necessarily in the short term because you're not a trading kind of guy, are you? No, we're not. No. We, we have uh, very definitive holding periods. I've plucked five uh, from our Australian portfolio to talk to you today, Peter. Um, and all of those five, again, we preface them uh, by saying that you should, uh, as all investors should, um, when investing in equities markets is take a three to five year horizon uh, when looking at these positions. Okay, let's kick off with your first one. Sure. Um, so, Peter, can I just um, holistically talk about, uh, just for, yeah. grant me 30 seconds if you if you would. Yeah. Um, Arminius Capital, uh, we have a number of different funds. The five stocks that I'm going to talk to you today about um, for your viewers are from our Australian uh, portfolio. So we, we run models for uh, globally uh, 1,525 stocks across America, Europe, Japan and Australia. Um, so that the five I'd like to talk to you about today um, are taken from constituents of the ASX 200. Um, so these stocks have to be uh, fairly robust uh, by market capitalization in order to uh, be granted uh, entrance into the, uh, the ASX 200 index. Um, so again, in accordance with the, the criteria um, that I want to talk to you about, uh, the reason why these stocks are being chosen for this portfolio, it's a concentrated portfolio. So we hold somewhere between 20 to 25 positions um, in this particular um, Australian equities portfolio. It's long only. Uh, we choose stocks based on uh, an above average uh, dividend yield um, of constituents of the ASX 200. Uh, we want them to have robust cash flows. Um, so these are going to be operating companies. These are not going to be the type of stocks um, that are moonshots or, um, you know, in the American arena uh, would be companies that don't generate any earnings whatsoever. So they're dividend paying, generate robust cash flows. Um, in addition to that, we pick them based on their level of volatility relative to the ASX 200 itself. So there's a, a tome um, of academic literature um, that stocks that exhibit lower levels of volatility relative to their, in, uh, to their benchmarks, the indexes, um, are better positions to hold um, over the long term. Um, and again, we also want low, not just low volatility to the index, but low levels of correlation um, to the index. So we get rid of basis risk from these positions. So the objective, Peter, is we are buying very, very robust stocks. Um, and again, this might come, uh, it might be an anathema um, to some of your viewers uh, to hear me say this, but the, the aim of this objective is not to pick stocks that are going to return 120% in the next 12 months. We are trying to eliminate high risk positions that would be otherwise detrimental to our portfolio. So uh, on the back of that, uh, thank you for, thank you for, the, uh, for the, the 30 second uh, spiel that you've allowed me there, but it's, it's very important just to put in context uh, these five positions that I now want to speak to um, uh, about the, the way that we select these companies. Um, jump in, tell me to, uh, to stop at any point in time, but um, for the viewers, again, those of, uh, those of 
the investors who don't know us, we are a quantitative house. Um, so we don't employ lots and lots of analysts uh, who go through uh, the qualitative background or the board composition of these companies. We are purely driven by the numbers. Um, that is to say, how much money are these companies making? And that's how we select these positions. So the first one, Peter, um, is stock code ALQ. Um, so this is a global lab testing company. Um, clearly, given what's happened through the pandemic, uh, life sciences have enjoyed uh, significant um, ability to generate profits. Um, they also have uh, geological assay work, um, which continues to pick up um, exploring for strategic minerals. And for those viewers who are interested uh, in the new world um, type of stocks, uh, this company has exposure, therefore, to strategic minerals that are used in batteries and renewables. Um, and as we like to say uh, about this company, um, it harkens back to the old adage, in a mining boom, you buy the companies that provide the picks and the shovels. Okay, so that's number one. Number two... Will be Before you move on, uh, the actual name of the company, is the name of the company ALQ? ALQ. Is that the ticker code? ALQ. Stock, yeah, the stock code is ALQ, Alpha Lima Quebec, uh, but the company name is, is ALS, yeah. Okay, good. And, and okay. And so that's your first one, and, yep. and, and these are all, let's emphasize, these are all ASX 200 listed companies. Absolutely. The second one should be uh, eminently known to all of your investors and viewers, and that is Bluescope uh, code BSL. Um, th this dovetails into the conversation that we had uh, a couple of weeks ago, Peter, when I spoke about the necessity for investors to get uh, exposure to Australian companies that in turn have exposure to America. Um, so Blue Scope, uh, as we all know, it's US steel mill, uh, is happily running at capacity, um, middle of an expansion, uh, in order, of course, to keep up for the incredible high demand for US steel. Um, as we've seen, the uh, as I'm looking at it here, the Case-Shiller uh, index uh, in America, uh, the year to date is up 29% um, in the US. About three weeks ago, that was 31%. Uh, sorry, in the last 12 months, sorry, not year today, 12 months. So there is a uh, clearly a housing boom uh, in the US and uh, increased propensity for infrastructure spending. Um, coming back home, um, Australian still demand, similarly, uh, as we all know, living in uh, Sydney and, uh, and uh, Melbourne and Brisbane and Perth, uh, demand continues to uh, rise through the economy is the lockdowns. Uh, hopefully, uh, we see the the light at the end of the tunnel. Blue Scope, pleasingly, is debt free. It's got eight hundred million dollars in cash. Um, the dividend yield is two point five percent. Again, we look uh, we look at that in the perspective in the perspective um, of uh, continued uh, share buybacks going further. Yeah. So, and also the analysts think there's about twenty eight point five percent upside. That's right. a consensus for you, and some some actually are even far more positive. Right, great, mate. Yep. That's the second one. What's your third one? So, uh, as we all know, Australia is uh, houses and holes with a little bit of farming thrown in. Um, so, our third pick here uh, that, that we hold in our portfolio, Peter, is Grandcore, uh, code GNC. Uh, as we know, Grandcore's core business um, is centred around collection, transport, and processing. Uh, of the wonderful Australian export commodity of grain. Um, now, the company, in addition to, to grains, the, they also crush edible oil seeds, uh, canola oil, as we all consume at the fish and chip shops, um, and processes and exports uh, those oils internationally. So, uh, in combination to its international uh, business operation, uh, again, coming back home, and you'll notice the flavour of uh, quite a few of what I'm speaking about here is the international um, exposure components of the companies, Peter. Um, coming back home operates the Oz Coal Centres for collections and recycling of cooking oil. Uh, Graincore, uh, on a holistic note, um, pleasingly works very closely with rural communities um, and going back to, I think it's 2015 uh, also, um, has sponsored a very popular silo art program uh, around Australia. Um, but again, Peter, we're also looking to that one um, for its uh, ability to leverage um, Australian export markets and the overseas uh, increase, as we've seen, and we've talked about in a number of our newsletters about the increase uh, in global food prices uh, since uh, probably the mid to late uh, 2020, 
circa around November, when the vaccine, the first vaccine was released to market, um, that we were going to be able to get out of this uh, malady and this predicament, um, food price inflation has really been a one-way street. So, uh, that's, and that's interesting. You have a company like that, and, and clearly, a company like Grain Corp can be affected by you know, drought and weather and things like that. And that's sure. why a three to five-year view on this on this company, hopefully, will. Um, overcome those kinds of seasonal challenges? Yes, yeah, for sure. I mean, as the old saying goes, if, if a farmer is not complaining, then he's not having a good time. But um, the the weather season that we're looking forward to, sorry, that we're looking uh, into um, coming up, uh, we believe there'll be sufficient but not excessive levels um, of, of rain. Compare this, uh, this situation in Australia with what's happening in the, in the US at the moment um, in key key grain growing regions in the US, uh, in the Midwest uh, of the United States, they are experiencing droughts at the moment, Peter. So again, the, the relativity of the favourability um, of the Australian uh, climactic scene, um, again, is, uh, is another tick uh, in, in grain cool's favour. Okay, let's go to number four now. Number four, Eluca, again, should be very well known to many of your investors and viewers. Code is ILU. Uh, clearly a mineral sands company. Um, uh, it uses mineral sands to make titanium dioxide, which is uh, a, a factor input um, into something that, again, thematically, the last two companies I've just spoken about, Grain Core uh, and Blue Scope, going into commodities such as paint, uh, pigment, uh, paper and plastics. A little bit of alliteration for your viewers there uh, with the holy quadrant of P's. Um, now, uh, jokes aside, we go back to the life. ordinary joke. By the way, you've done better in your lifetime. But go on. Well, I, I am a father, Peter. So, uh, as we say, we'll just allocate that to the dad joke column. No um, the the global economic recovery uh, is clearly well underway, which is very pleasing to see that it's lifting uh, prices um, all over the world. But therein again lies the rub: uh, is that I'm sure some of your viewers who read. Uh, widely, um, we'll see that there is uh, commentary um, going around in uh, in the US around Coca-Cola. I mentioned paint um, in one of my four P's there, um, but Aluka uh, submits uh, a, a production into. They're talking about inflation, um, and in the context of having uh, containers such as paint tins or perhaps. Um, uh, chip packets or lolly packets or drink containers um, of actually decreasing so that so not to affect uh, consumers' uh, literal mentality to, to decrease the volume of the size of the container that the good that they're selling is coming in whilst keeping the price level the same. Right. Okay? So you are literally looking at the, at the situation um, of uh, companies in the U.S., for, for example, um, selling a paint of, tin, a, a paint of tin that was possibly four litres previously and they're going to they're gonna fill it at 3.7 litres or commensurate in gallons um, but charge the same price for it. Okay, so, so this is, we saw uh, last week, Peter, we didn't speak, but uh, the US CPI print, the US inflation was 5.4%. Uh, um, which, again, is inflation that we haven't seen, levels of inflation we haven't seen for over 30 years. Um, the Arminius perspective, I don't know if you share this uh, professionally or anecdotally, um, is that we don't think um, that this is going to slow down uh, very much going into 2022. Um, and based on global supply chain uh, issues, um, this possibly may extend in 2023. So going back to Aluka, again, sorry about the... Uh, the little global macro um, spiel on the side. Um, Eluca carries no debt, has uh, a touch over $200 million uh, in cash, um, and they are looking um, to expand their rare earths uh, refinery portfolio. So uh, Eluca so yep. comes up now on our uh, quantitative modelling, Peter. And, and do they pay a reasonable dividend uh, also? Yeah, they do. Um, if you bear with me for... Uh, a moment or two. I'm going to speak about uh, James Hardy next, um, Peter, um, yeah. whilst I just get the system um, pulling up over here. 
Um, so if we look at across uh, to a Luca, um, the funny thing about a Luca um, is that one of those uh, rare earths uh, refineries uh, is sitting on top of a, uh, a monazite stockpile at a at a place that I can't pronounce and I'm not going to pretend to pronounce. But um, suffice to say, the again the mainstream media has been very complimentary, perhaps misguided, but um, alerting the world um, to the strategic uh, importance of rare earth materials, and these go into things uh, not just like mobile phones, um, but also glamorous vehicles such as F-35 um, fighter jets. So the Aluka dividend, Peter, coming back to it, to your question, currently paying a dividend of, of 1.5%. Um, but again, we've held these stocks in our portfolio for uh, approximately six months. So the the dividend yield that I'm reading off to you there, similarly to the dividend yield that we spoke about um, with Bluescape at 2.5%, um, uh, they're still fine. The companies, obviously, we, we, we continue to hold them. Um, but the price point that we entered these positions, um, the dividend was, uh, uh, at the time of entry, was, was uh, much higher than that. Okay. So uh -huh. if we move to James Hardy, yep. um, again, this will be the... What the fourth? No, really the fifth. The fifth. The fifth. Oh, five out of five. Five. Sorry, sorry. Five out of five. What, what I'm getting to is oh. the continued uh, thematic uh, play of international exposure here. America will provide approximately two thirds of both the sales levels and the profits for James Hay. Um, so June quarter uh, sales are up about 25%. Um, uh, EBIT was up almost 30%. Uh, so, again, we get the direct influence of the U.S. housing boom that I spoke about, approximately 30% increase in the last 12 months as COVID-19 and the fear uh, around COVID-19 uh, is banished and consumers uh, dip into their pockets and go out and spend. Um, James Hardy uh, has a very, very well-established um, fibre cement uh, product chain uh, in, in the market um, and the push there uh, is to get rid of um, vinyl and wood um, in, in the years ahead. So the company uh, is launching a, a fairly well strategically planned assault um, on, on brick as a direct competitor to, to this product. Um, but again, we're looking to um, leverage off, uh, again, the difference between Australia and the US at the moment, even though Australia uh, on a... Uh, pure house index price level basis, housing has Im uh, has uh, has improved manifoldly more than US housing prices, but it's actually the construction um, in America and not to be not to state the obvious, but uh, a target market of something like 340 million people uh, in the US looking to uh, to build houses. Not all of them, obviously, but uh, but a lot of them. Um, dwarfs the uh, the opportunities for uh, companies listed on the ASX 200 who are domestically focused. Okay, mate. So there, there are your five companies. Now, yep. I guess we'll, let, let's just finish off with like your your view on 2022. Last week, I interviewed Bill Evans from Westpac, and Bill ah. has, has a view that um, um, 2022 Australia could grow by seven percent. Big number. Surprisingly big number. What's our mini's capital predicting for Australian economic growth in 2022? So, so he's saying GDP, a GDP print of 7%, not a, not an ASX 200 print. No, no, economic growth. GDP print. Um, big number, isn't it? Yes, it is a sizable number. Uh, but again, looking at the US experience, um, they had a material again. The problem with the problem with comparing Australia with the US, as as was the problem when we used the comparators in the GFC, uh, is that in Australia in the GFC, most people's portfolios, including all of the industry superannuation funds, fell in excess of fifty percent. You know, so somewhere between forty five and fifty percent. But we never had a housing crisis in Australia in the GFC. Moving forward to the to the the viral pandemic of 2020, you had commensurate drawdowns in equity markets. So Q1 in 2020, most stock markets lost about 35%. Um, our global macro fund made 5%, made 5.3%. 
while equity markets fell 35% in Q1. So we were ranked 10th in the world internationally for global macro funds. But economies collapsed commensurately. Australia, in order for him to come to a 7% GDP print, he's really put it, he's factoring in there a massive V bounce out. And as we've been saying in our newsletters for some time, we think that the recovery out has been tracking more of a W shape. And the problem, well, not the problem, my point of contention uh, with a 7% GDP print is that remove what happened to the stock market for six months. Uh, we finished Christmas 2020 with a, a stock market pretty much line ball where it was Christmas 2019. Um, and put into one side again the imposition of the lockdowns upon people's mental health and small business livelihoods. But the reason why Western Australia can continue on the way it has is because economically speaking, most of what we do in this country is dig stuff up out of the ground and export it. And the, the, the impact to the core components of, the national, of what provides the national accounts weren't really impacted anywhere near as much in Australia as they were in America. I mean, in America, the real level of unemployment by about April, May 2020 was about 26%, Peter, on a, on a different type of metric than what the BLS um, puts out. We, we look at the U6 level um, of unemployment in America, which the BS, BLS provides. So my point is Australia, I don't think Australia fell down a deep enough economic hole in 2020 to allow it to have that massive bounce back of a 7% print. Um, historically speaking, mean GDP growth in Australia uh, is around 3%. Um, so he's saying that that they are expecting, uh, and I bank with I bank with Westpac, full disclosure, um, they are they are expecting that the GDP recovery will be tw more than twice the long-term mean GDP of Australia. Uh, I, I struggle a little bit, Peter, a okay. little bit. Yeah, okay. Well, I hope he's right. I feel oh, because me too. Very, very, very the stock market. But I, I, I must admit, it surprised me as well, Marcel. It's yeah, surprising. yeah. Look, I'm very happy, but again, as I say, these big GDP numbers, in order to achieve them, it actually means that yesteryear you have fallen significantly and the Australian economy really didn't. Mate, great to talk to you. Thanks for your, your uh, contribution and we'll catch up to you in a month or two. Look forward. Take care, take care Peter. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Next guest is Mark Carnegie. I interviewed him for my podcast uh, on Wednesday, and I thought there was a, a certain section here that I would like to share with you tonight. And uh, I think it will actually show investors how cryptocurrencies may be, um, in a sense, very hard to ignore. Mark Carnegie, why, why was it so significant that Senator Andrew Bragg, um, in his report on Australian Australia as a, a technology and financial centre. Why was it important that Bitcoin, or sorry, uh, blockchain technology was a part of all that? Explain to us the future, as you said, incorporating blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies, if you like. Okay, so let's park Bitcoin, which, as I say, is yep. a pure political game theory, and just park that. Yeah. The Think about there is $140 trillion a year traded on what is called the SWIFT network, which is essentially the payments arrangement that deals with how money moves around the world. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Right. And essentially a casino that is completely rigged by the incumbent banks and the central banks of the world to... Um, leg over consumers everywhere. All right. Now, do they do it because they think they're doing it for the right reasons, mainly keeping economies going, employing people, and not having major recessions and Great Depressions? Is that the no. reason why they do it? No. no. Monetary policy and all of those things are separate to this. This is purely and simply 
the plumbing of the global um, trade in money. Okay. If you were sitting there and saying, oh, yes, but they do that to stop money laundering and stuff like that, you wouldn't have $160 billion in US dollar, $100 notes circulating outside America completely and utterly without any sense of where those are. So the argument, which is always, oh, Bitcoin and crypto is used to money launder, the American government has $160 billion of, of $100 notes out there outside America that are used to money launder, yeah? So mm -hmm. it is very much the case of the pot calling the kettle black there. So none of it is to do with that, Peter. There are legitimate questions about these CBDCs, which are these central bank digital currencies and stuff like that. But that's a different component of this. This is just purely and simply, if you're trying to send money to your cousin or your aunt in another country, the money leaves your bank account, arrives somewhere else three days later, you get charged fees you don't understand, yeah, for reasons which you can't understand. Right. And as in crypto said, that's absolutely ri ridiculous. There's just a couple of entries um, in a computer file cost you virtually nothing to do it. And therefore, we can attack the $140 trillion and do it for a fraction of the cost. Okay, so so are you arguing then that the the, the system that currently d does something, a great example, someone wants to transfer money to someone overseas, that that this is like a monopoly and the charges are ridiculous and the arguments that this has to be protected because of threats like money laundering and whatever is just basically bullshit. Is that what you're saying? Unequivocally. There are genuine questions about money laundering. I'm not pretending they're not. And there are genuine questions about monetary policy, and I'm not pretending they're not. But to be arguing that the SWIFT network does anything that other than look after a small group of um, incumbents is ridiculous. This is purely and simply rorting by the, um, the powerful. Yeah. So are you also saying that even if there were well-meaning policymakers around the world, they they wouldn't have the uh, the intestinal fortitude to take on the current system because it's just too, a too hard basket for most politicians, most central bankers? Yeah. I mean, there's a phrase that they have out there called regulatory capture, yeah, which is the regulators get captured by the industry, yeah? Mm. Ultimately, what you saw in the 2008 GFC was that the world was willing to turn upside down for 30,000 really rich people at the same time as they weren't willing to do anything about climate in 2008. They had the Copenhagen suburb at the same time as they had the GFC, and they looked after everybody who was in financial services by upending the world and did absolutely nothing about climate. If there was ever a better example of um, regulatory capture, you couldn't have seen it. And that was what enraged the crypto guys who started this whole thing. They just said, this is rigged for the rich and we're not going to cop it anymore. All right. So um, so how does the blockchain technology um, improve on what we've currently got? I, I, think, I, I think I know the answer, but I want you to say it. How does it improve on um, what we've currently got and what's the likelihood over time, just like climate, um, that, that will eventually be accepted as the alternative? Well, so I think that these things jump the shark, yeah? I think it is already seeing mainstream adoption. When the Nigerians tried to shut it down in Nigeria, 80% um, of remittances were on the blockchain um, within three months, despite them banning it. So I, I see this is something that's going to work from the outside in. The, the use of crypto for you, Peter, in day-to-day -day existence is probably you know, interesting, but it's not going to change your life. Yeah, you're going to be pissed about a $100 fee on a $300 transfer to send money you know, somewhere in the world, but 
overall, you'll cop it and keep going. For these people in poor countries, it's not like that at all. This is absolutely life-changing from them. So for me, crypto moves from the outside in. It moves from the marginal economies in the world to the mainstream. And I don't think, given how efficient it is, it's, it is stoppable at this point. You watch China trying to shut it down, um, and truth be told, they've all picked up already. All the miners have moved to different countries. All of the guys who understand this area have moved to Singapore. The run is on. Yeah, And then we get to the core question here, which you have to, unfortunately, it's a head scratcher, but it is this question about have these guys solved something really important when they've been able to create these trustless um, networks that are 100% trustless, trustworthy. That is, you know you can move the money around and you don't have to worry about somebody rorting it. Now, that's a day-to-day -day thing. You know, they're out people are out trying to hack these systems all the time so it's not that it's riskless but there is huge improvement happening all the time in terms of the payment system so i wouldn't be sitting there and saying it's 100 percent guaranteed but i think in terms of the change the technological change that's happening it's really only mopping up operations at okay this so stage. someone someone like matt common at cba he must be looking at this as being a, a threat to the, the, the current operation of his organisation, is that right? Well, I th think certainly to the international. I mean, I take a rather extreme view about that, which is that there are broadly three blocks of people in my world. There are the people around Ethereum, this guy, Vitalik Buterin. There's two brothers who run a business called Stripe out of San Francisco, two Irish brothers. And there's the incumbent banking system, yeah? Mm. If you were sitting there and looking at that as a horse race, yeah, mm. you'd have two people who could, you know, be odds-on favourite for the Cox Plate and one horse with three legs, yeah? Yeah. And unfortunately, the incumbent bankers, yeah, have not a chance in this fight. They don't know what's going to hit them. Joining us now is Charles Tarbert, the founder of Century 21. Charles, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Peter. Uh, look, I, I want to talk to you about the general performance of the market um, mm. first, and then I will drill down into some areas to see what you, you, you see, see going on. Okay. At least three months ago, you tipped that once lockdown is over, we would see a big supply of properties coming on the market. Is that happening? Oh, most definitely. That, that's been happening every week now. I watched it was like three weeks ago. It was 3.3% 3, 3 up on the week before, 2.94%, 3.04% last week, 2.76%. So like there's that climb. And over this time last year, it's 1.94% higher. And I know that the Melbourne auction, so uh, this coming weekend, it's a record, like it's a record number of properties going to auction. And so if you thought it was... Um, difficult for people to buy because there wasn't enough stock and they were all competing with each other. Well, you, you've practically got to say, well, hey, you know what? That's probably going to slow down a little bit if there's that much more property coming on the market, which, which is, again, something we predicted a few months back before the lockdown. We could see it happening before the lockdown, but, yeah, you, you know, that. Nat naturally lockdown changed everything in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, what's the, the demand like right now? Is, is the demand still pretty high? The demand's there, certainly in, in, in uh, the Brisbane market, uh, the Adelaide market, Perth. I've I spoken to the agents in those areas, and they're all having issues with stock still. But you've got to remember some of those marketplaces, like your, your Brisbane market or, or Perth or even Adelaide, started well behind the eight ball, whereas with Sydney and Melbourne, the prices were already up there to start with. Uh, and uh, the only one that, that uh, bucked that trend was uh, Hobart, because... That one really, um, when I looked at that just a few months ago and I looked at the 20-year price change, uh, Sydney had a 200-something a, a percent price change but in that period of time or price increase, but Hobart had a 288% increase in that 20-year period higher than Sydney. 
So it's the ones that have started from behind the eight ball that are really still going okay. But as they start to catch up with some of them are doing, as stock levels start to increase, which is happening, and as the borrowing capacity of people starts to change because prices have gotten so high that some people just can't get in the marketplace, you sort of suspect, which is what we did three months ago, that there'd be a change in the market. It's not a crash, but definitely a change. 2022, Charles, are you expecting prices to rise, but really rise at a much slower rate over the course of the year? I, I am. Uh, obviously, they're talking interest rates, and every time you see a report, uh, you, you don't know what to believe anymore. It, it goes from you know, early next year to 2024. I heard a, a, on the news this morning, oh, no, we won't get a, a rate rise, highly unlikely uh, you know, for some time to come. And I'm thinking that is going to be one factor. that coupled with the levels of stock climbing, those two things are really going to impact on pricing in the next uh, in the next year. Yeah. Um, if someone is, has missed out, continuously missed out on buying a property, would you advocate that they actually b have the belief that they may well be seeing much better prices in a year's time? I think they've got a better chance to negotiate. Uh, a position. The problem is, is that your property goes on the market and the agent might give you a price guide. And before you know it, it's gone well beyond that price guide and into, into the stratosphere in some cases. So that's the biggest issue. When, when we get back to normal real estate, which, which is where, you know, buyers and sellers are, are meeting in a certain, certain place uh, and, they're, and they're taking some time to do that, then you'll see the change. But what we have now has just gone beyond crazy. I'm a bit concerned, I think I've mentioned this to you before, for some people that have bought, they, they, if, if they ever want to sell in the next cycle of real estate, they probably won't get that capital growth. They'll probably have to wait two real estate cycles to get any serious capital growth. That, that's a big concern, particularly if interest rates jump. And if they go from three to five, which is not unreasonable, that's a massive increase in repayments. So th those things combined with the fact that they paid too much in some cases for property could indicate that in a couple of years' time there may be some serious stress uh, on people with their mortgages. When it comes to investing, I always like to, to buy stocks, quality stocks, when the market's beating up on them and, 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 and be patient and, and wait for them to come back. And we, we even saw it with the CBA, it was $60 you know, in, in 2020. It was a good time to buy. Now it's one hundred and five dollars. So that was a, a classic example of buying a quality asset when the market's beating up on it. Now, yeah. uh, a section of the market that would the, that had been beaten up, when everyone was chasing houses, were apartments, and particularly apartments around the CBD of Sydney and Melbourne. Mm. Now, over time, are they going to get popular again? And therefore, is it a buying opportunity for the patient investor? Uh, to, yeah. to look at, looking at the CBDs of Sydney and Melbourne? A, a very patient investor because uh, I think that what you're finding now is that a lot of people, because of low interest rates, that were tenants have gone out and bought. And I've noticed that the rent prices over a period, a long period of time, particularly in Sydney, haven't really changed much. Uh, and, uh, and so I would suspect that it's got to be somebody who's willing to wait because I think the vacancy rates in Sydney will probably climb as people start to move into homes that, that they've bought uh, with government guarantees that are taking some time to build because of lack of material coming into the country and, and builders are all very busy. So but eventually when they do that, I don't think it's, well, I don't think it's going to be a good one for investors who are hoping and, and putting everything just on one property alone. I think they may have to look at reducing their rents to keep a good tenant. Yeah, and I'm thinking to myself, Charles, that if it takes a year to bring back foreign students mm. and to bring back the kind of tourists that would have rented Airbnb apartments in CBD, Sydney and Melbourne, it, when that happens, then the value of these properties would Correct. start to rise. Is that, is that logical analysis? It's, to me, it's very logical, but that, it's that period of time of waiting that if a, a person is a first-time investor, they might struggle with it. And that's the concern. That's why I don't think you'll see that big movement. But there are a lot of apartments still to go. There's still apartments under construction. There's a lot of people who have bought off the plan. There's probably quite a few people that won't be in a position to complete if the market changes slightly. Because, you, as you know, valuations are done by banks when they're ready to settle, not, not the time of purchase two years ago. So that could change it. Interest rate movement could change their ability to 
uh, repay. And that gives the bank every reason to walk away. So I think there's a lot of ifs out there at the moment, more than normal, but the marketplace we're in right now is brilliant for sellers and, and real estate agents alike, a bit tough on buyers. Okay. Well, one last question, and this is a, a kind of outside the square type of, um, strategy, but I, I'm always thinking about younger people who, who want to get in the property market, but the housing side of it is so hard nowadays. Um, we're not going to put this forward as a recommended strategy, but could you see the value of some young people, maybe two, a working couple, um, buying a, a, a city apartment to effectively live in for a while, but eventually when the values of the, the, the property goes up, it becomes like their, their, their foothold in the property market to one day buy a home, maybe when they've got kids and they need more space, that this 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 to a cheap property may well be a buying opportunity for the future. Yeah, you've got a better chance of doing that with, a, with an apartment, uh, for sure. And, uh, and, and, and again, the golden rule is don't buy real estate for the sake of just getting into the marketplace. A lot of people make that mistake, Peter. Uh, they buy in areas where there's definitely very little potential for capital growth. And so they'll sit there for years and years and years having received rental income potentially and no capital growth. So they're still behind the eight ball. So getting into the market for the sake of it is dangerous, but if you're looking at, at city locations where there are apartments and there are plenty of them, they will come good. It's an area that will come good, and you've got a safer bet with all the infrastructure around you there than you have in running out, because a lot of people are running out into regional areas as well, which has pushed the prices up in regional areas beyond what most people even believed would ever happen. Mm -hmm. And so I think capital growth in those areas follows the capital cities. It doesn't Capital growth doesn't start from a region working back into the cities, it's the other way around. Okay, and a, f a final related question is, um, at least five years ago, there was a, a glut of Brisbane apartments around the CBD, um, and a lot of people who bought in there were disappointed. Have those apartments eventually improved in value? Are they more sellable? Are they more in demand than they were five or six years ago? They're starting to move, starting to move in value because the... Queensland market or Brisbane market in particular is getting some really good prices again. So things have jumped there uh, significantly. But keeping in mind that years and years and years ago, you could sell a property in Sydney and go to Brisbane and buy a property, get the same sort of property for half the price. Mm. And at one stage, Brisbane market got so close to Sydney prices, you couldn't do that. Well, we're back now where that is possible. And you've got a lot of people who who's making those decisions mm. early to say, hey, yeah, maybe it is time to retire early. Maybe it is time to, to uh, downsize. And so a Brisbane market particularly has got a lot of benefit because of that. Charles, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Peter. That's Charles Tarvey, the founder of Century 21. And that was Charles Tarvey of Century 21. That's the show for tonight. Thanks for joining us. If you want to know more about us, you can go to switzer.com.au or if you want to get more information on investing stocks, have a look at switzerreport.com.au. Thanks for joining us. See you on Monday.